Katie, you're muted. I'm so sorry. Perfect. No worries. All right. Hello and welcome to Textiles and Tea with the Handweavers Guild of America. My name is Katie Clements. Kathy is away on vacation, so I get to be your host today. Today's episode of Textiles and Tea is sponsored by Carolina Fiber Fest, which will take place March 14th and 15th in Raleigh, North Carolina. It's where yarn enthusiasts come to celebrate all things fiber. See, as always, we welcome your questions and we'll try to address as many as we can at the end of the program. Please submit your questions using the Q&A button, but not the chat option, because it's hard to see them in the chat. But please keep the comments coming. We'd love to see the feedback. Today, we are having tea with Sydney Sogol. Sydney is a professional weaver and dyer dedicated to creating bold color and pattern interactions through her original designs. She specializes in one of a kind and limited edition pieces, drawing inspiration from her extensive studies in art, ornithology, and marine biology. Each piece is handwoven using sustainably sourced plant yarns. Sydney also hand dyes and hand paints the yarns to capture the natural beauty and unique stories of the creatures that inspire her work. In addition, Sydney operates a sustainability-focused business, Sid's Threads, whose mission is to weave stories of nature into each creation, emphasizing sustainability, craftsmanship, and mindful living. By harmoniously blending the beauty of nature with the elegance of artisanal techniques, she strives to cultivate a deeper connection between individuals and the planet. So welcome, Sydney. Hey. Hi. How are you doing? I'm doing well. I'm so, excited to be here. For, excited to be here as well. And to hear and hear from you and see your work. Uh, first official question, what is your favorite tea? Well, seeing as I'm a tea drinker and not coffee at all, this is a great question. Um, I currently have my favorite tea right here, which is uh, just Earl Grey with vanilla in it. <laughs> so, that sounds delicious. It's quite good. <laughs> I'm just like, every day, it's what I go to. Um, I like the vanilla edition. Quite, yeah. Uh, so how did you get started in fiber? Um, so I taught myself how to weave a little bit when I was in high school on um, what I later learned was a broken upright tapestry loom. Um, so that was a fun adventure um, where I graduated high school and kept going back to school to finish the tapestry I was working on. Um, but then in college, I took a weaving class um, at Earlham with Nancy Taylor and fell in love and was like, okay, that's it. I found my thing. So, and you mentioned Earlham College, uh, a number of prior guests on textile and tea have had a science background, you as well. Mm -hmm. uh, you studied weaving and biology at Earlham College. Can you talk about how you blend those two passions of yours? Yeah, so I really focused on art and then like macrobiology. So a lot with like animal behavior and ornithology being study of birds and marine biology being the study of marine <laughs> of creatures in the ocean. Um, so I kind of was trying to figure out how to combine the two. And in my opinion, you really can't beat the amazing colors and balance of colors found in nature. Um, so like birds specifically is kind of where my heart goes with that. Um, everyone can see birds wherever they are. Um, and they're constantly, you know, you hear them, you see them. I love that factor and being able to tell their story through fiber art and like weaving because it's so structure and pattern based and so color based. Um, so I just try to pay homage to each bird for each of the color ways that I do. And then just like kind of blending those two together. And then when I do big wall pieces, they really end up telling a more narrative story visually with using the fiber kind of woven and unwoven. So it's, it's a fun balance between the two. What was the first project that you intentionally said, I'm, I'm combining weaving and nature? Ooh. That's okay, we can come back. No, it's a good one. Uh, I mean, it's kind of been con consistent. Um, I, mean, I feel like I did a couple in undergrad where it was like tree based, where it was like, you know, browns and greens and like, cause there's a lot of those patterns that kind of look leafy-esque 
or Barky esque in like the uh, like eight chef pattern book. And I was like, I want to try that. So that was before I started like designing patterns. Um, and then I wove on a shaft switching loom for my undergrads, like senior project that no one knew how to use. So I just kind of figured it out. Um, and I mean, I did pieces that were very, very geometric, like mazes, but then I, I got really inspired by the, um, the Nazca lines. Um, and so I was doing big geometric versions of that. Um, so it kind of started then, um, if not before, and then yeah, I just continued to to build off of that. What was the term you used? What lines? Nazca lines. Yeah, I don't know what that is. Uh, ho hopefully, A, I'm pronouncing it right. Um, B, they're down in South America, and they're these giant, they're not sculptures, um, but they're, they're only visible from aerial. And they're these giant, beautiful, very geometric images of like birds and like people. Um, and so they're very interesting. Um, and they were made way, way back. Um, I don't remember the dates or I'd even, I would try to guess, um, but they're really interesting. Um, and so I, if you, someone should look them up <laughs> and like check them out. They're really interesting to look at. Um, and so you can see how that would translate into like weaving now, even like, like double weave pickup and like all that kind of stuff would make it very conducive to that kind of imagery. It sounds like it. Uh, yeah. So now you're a full-time fiber artist. That's mm -hmm. sort of it, right? So yeah. what are the challenges uh, of being a professional fiber artist? All of them. Um, <laughs> um, Let's it's, hear it. it's the whole game of like, I'm, I came into this as someone who was trained as an artist to think like an artist. And I come in with like a, a technically a fine art background because I have my bachelor's degree in art and then my master's in fine art in textile design as well. Um, and so I, I know how to think about making art. I did not know how to think about running a business. Um, so that's something that I've kind of taught myself along the way and um, really through the help of like finding people in the weaving community and like the craft show community and friends um, where I'm just like, hey, how do you do this? And like learning how to file proper taxes for a company and like you know, all that kind of stuff, um, as well as trying to balance the whole, like, need to make something creatively, as well as the want and need to make something that will sell, um, as well, and that balance, I kind of lean towards the, I make what I want and think looks good, because then I'm pouring my energy and my passion into it, and if that's in there, I feel like then people will generally like it, um, and that seems to be what's worked for me so far as far as like that component. Um, and then, I mean, I really like working on like commission pieces. I really like teaching. Um, so it's just kind of like piecemealing everything together and just kind of going with what works. Um, it's constantly evolving. I'm constantly changing what I'm doing minus the nature inspired component of things. That is like the strong line within the whole company and like that kind of component. So I, it's a whole adventure. It's still evolving. I'm, this is my studio outside my house, which we've been in now for next month will be a year. So that's pretty exciting too. I never thought I'd have a studio outside my house. <laughs> is there, do you find like there's a discipline involved or just, it's just something you need to do or kind of a combination of both? Uh, as far as like getting things done? Yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, I refer to myself as a mean boss half the time. Um, <laughs> so be nice, Sydney, be nice. <laughs> Jokes, but like, well, my boss won't give me the day off. I have to go to work. Like that kind of stuff. Um, when I'm trying to like doing the other, like my, my counterpart to this outside of weaving is I ride horses, um, which is a massively time consuming thing. Um, so I'll, I'll make a joke like, Oh, my boss won't let me off. I have, I have to go back to work. Um, so it's like that kind of stuff, but yeah, I mean, it takes, it takes drive because you're your own, you're your own boss. And it's like, there might be deadlines, but there might not be deadlines. It really just depends on like how things are running. So. You mentioned teaching. What do you like about teaching? Cause you sounded so enthusiastic when you talked to me. Uh, I just, I like sharing information. I like seeing people like click and get that spark in there. Um, and really kind of like unlock various things that might've been like holding them back or like pushing them to be like, look, just like try a little, like 
try to push that harder in a direction that like might be uncomfortable. Um, it's the same idea as like, if I'm, I don't, I, I don't like green, um, particularly, but like I'm learning. I, no, no, I'm not offended by it. Um, it has a place, uh, <laughs> but like, I'm good with it. <laughs> and so like, I've been using it more and I'm like, okay, I don't dislike it as much. Like it has, it has spots, but like when people have something like that, where I'm like, okay, how do we get you to move and like work through that? Um, as well as just like sharing, like I've been doing this for a while now and especially like dying. Um, like that's something that I'm really passionate about. And like, I like sharing about it and like talking about it. And, and so it's like, kind of like, how do we get people to like exposed to these various things? And then be like, you know, if you want to try it out, cool, do it once. If you don't want, if it's not your thing, don't do it. Like if you're not having fun, that's yeah. not the game. <laughs> like, All right. Well, let's look at some of your images. Uh, so this one, this is the Splendid Fairy Wren Capelet that was woven with plant-based exotic fiber blends. What is the appeal of using plant-based yarns? I've always been drawn to plant fibers. Um, when I started working with Tencel in grad school, I was like, oh, yes, done, hooked like hook, line, sinker. I basically exclusively work in tensile and tensile blends. Um, I do like a run of napkins every like other year in cotton. <laughs> Otherwise I'm like, nope. <laughs> um, so I, it it's a pleasure to work with. It dies up like silk, is easy to care for. And my standing joke when I'm at craft fairs, is I'm like, you know what? It's machine washable because I'm not here to make your life harder. That's for other people. <laughs> so like- I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm currently where I just love it. Um, and so I'm also, um, a vegetarian. I have nothing against wool. I think wool is wonderful. Um, but I just really like kind of like going full plant on, on as much as I can in my life. Um, also being in North Carolina, we don't have a ton of sheep. There are definitely plenty. There's definitely plenty. And there's some very cute. I have a friend who has her alpacas and I love them and they're so adorable. And I like it so much. Um, so like I occasionally pull that kind of stuff, but like, I'm just obsessed with plant fibers and I, I really like working with them. Uh, getting amazing results. Uh, so the cape, this is so beautiful and it's enhanced by the romantic background of this photo. How did it come to be that these were uh, photographed in Paris? So my, so this is actually my sister and myself. Um, so she was moving to Paris for work. Wow. Um, and she asked me if I would help her move. And I was like, yeah, totally. And, and like, I was thinking about a couple months beforehand, I've had these ideas for making the capelets, uh, like kind of floating around and I was planning on doing them that fall. Um, and, uh, and so like, I was like, okay. And I was like, when I like called her, I said, so I have this crazy idea. I was like, what if we do a, like, would you model with me if we do a photo shoot in Paris? I was like, I can hire a photographer and a makeup artist. I was like, I can't pay for models yet. But I was like, I could do the other two. Cause it's like getting a makeup artist would make us have more confidence. <laughs> um, and so I did it. And I, I, it was the first professional photo shoot I ever had um done um with models in my in my work and her and I got to do it and so it's it's extra special for those reasons um and it was really cool to be able to like get to go and like help her move and then be like oh p.s quick this whole day we're gonna wander around Paris and these spots I've picked out and I've worked out with this photographer who speaks English and French luckily and we're gonna go around and we're gonna do this shoot for the entire day and so it was it was a really magically cool experience it does look magical, yeah. especially with your sister. And yeah. you may have a new side career. <laughs> sure. <laughs> that looks great. Uh, so now you're a very accomplished dyer. Mm -hmm. Dyers are like magicians to me. <laughs> oh. Yeah. So how did you get started in dyeing? Uh, again, I started in undergrad. Um, we had this, this, the weaving studio at Earlham was really cute. They now moved into, they got a brand new building. Yay, Ben! Um, but we were in like the attic of a building. Um, and so there was this really cute, like, uh, closet dying room, which was in essence what it was. And I started, we, and I was doing a lot of, um, rugs at the time. And so I was dying wool. Um, so it's like, I, I dyed 
so like Nancy taught me how to dye wool and like so we did that and then like I was like oh this because I I'm like I like control I mean we're weavers we like control <laughs> um and so I was like but I want my colors and so I learned to dye um and then from there I kind of was like cool how do I keep doing that what do I want to do um and it's like I want unfortunately my dye my like yarn wall is over there um but you would see like the five the 10 shades of blue that I have died not surprising to anyone but because I'm like I want the full range of what I want to work with and especially when I'm like matching colorways for like the birds that are coming from my inspiration I'm like okay like what do I want to work with which shade how like how is that going to work um and so I just continue to do it I have a giant spreadsheet of dye recipes um and then I have like watercolor notebooks. Um, I switched from very sophisticated, uh, basically crayon drawings to <laughs> learning to use watercolors a little bit better. So I could like paint out my, like how I'm going to paint warps. And then I have them so I can like repeat them, but they're all still one of a kind. Cause even though you're mixing dye, dye particles are all, most of them are mixed and therefore you're going to get a slightly different color with each scoop for the method I use for these. So it's like, I just keep playing with it and mixing color combos and being like, what do I work with now? And like, how do I do that? And I just, I, I do think of it as kind of like a magic pot thing and being like, how do you do that? I also really enjoy the full getup I wear when I die, where I'm like aproned, gloved up, masked up. I'm like, all right, I'm ready. Let's go into this. Let's do the lab. <laughs> like, it's, brings that science part in where I'm like, you know, balancing, like make sure my pH and my soda ash soak is right. And then like how, like having the formulas, I'm like, okay, here we go. <laughs> like, it's a nice uh, combo of play and structure. Yeah, exactly. Sometimes I, I don't write a formula down, which is uncommon. Um, but, but a lot of sometimes I'm like, okay, I'm really gonna do this one off. Like I'm not gonna record it. And then that's, it's exciting and scary all at one time. Daring, that's cool. <laughs> So some more works, uh, they show your uh, great skill with dyeing, like you talked about, and your mastery of color. Uh, it, there's a debate whether color is an innate understanding or it's a skill that's learned. What are your thoughts on that? Uh, so I'll let all of y'all in on a secret in that I have never actually taken a color theory class in my life. <laughs> so, I mean, I've read about color theory and like I've talked color a lot um but I never take it so I think it's a combo of both I think some people are innately good at understanding the colors and how to blend like put them together um and I think some people are really scared of color um I I personally don't don't get that um I love color um I have a very colorful life I have very I mean I I finally dyed my hair to match all my stuff per se and like um I was like how do I add more color to life and I I mean again just if you're scared of color just look around you because again nature has the most amazing color combos like if if you think things don't go go look up what a mantis shrimp looks like those things are wild they also have like the highest color vision in the entire like animal kingdom um it is fascinating um so it's like the, I mean like the colors around us are just stunning and so I just try to again like harness that energy and like look at things and be like well that's an interesting color combo like have I seen that um and like the the cable in the middle the black white and red I am like how do I do those like striking color combos which are that's I mean it's classic it's a very classic color combo but like how do I like twist it to be my own version of that? Um, so like, that's kind of like how I would say about like the idea of like color. I think color theory is like really interesting. I did get to see um, the Annie and, oh no, what's her counterpart's name? Steven? Albers? Joseph jo Albers? Joseph Joseph Thank you. I was like, it went right on my brain. Um, yeah, I saw their joint uh, retrospective exhibit actually in Paris because I saw that an ad on the train and I was like I gotta go um, so uh, I like saw that and it was really interesting to see like all this face of like her her work step one Whew, amazing um but like his color theory stuff um and like that was really interesting to like see the the difference in that and it's, it's fun when you get to like play with that and I mean like with weaving we're not truly blending colors we're 
optically blending because the colors aren't actually mixing. They're just laying on top, which is why like echo weaves are so fascinating with all the iridescence in them. So. Um, so the next photo is, um, it's, you've got, it shows the nature and the, um, uh, you're weaving, nature influenced weaving. Oh. <laughs> Here it goes. Uh, and this warp is just exquisite. It makes me happy to look at it. Uh, so this bird on the left, a chestnut back tanager, you were mimicking the colors. Um, what are some of your other sources for color inspiration? It's pretty, pretty solidly birds right now. <laughs> it's been birds for like the last five, six years. Um, I mean, I have like a New Zealand collection. I did my study abroad there. And so New Zealand is like known for its birds. There are no native mammals there. And so like, I would go to like, basically these like bird parks that felt like you were going to Jurassic Park with like double gates and giant fences. Cause I was trying to keep out like the possums and the cats to, so that like the, the kiwis would be okay. And like the Takahe, cause they have a lot of flightless birds that would just like walk up to you and be like, Hey, what's up? And you're like, Oh my God. Um, so trying not to squeal while like a nice bird walks up to you. You're like, Oh my God, this is amazing. Um, so, I mean, like really a lot of birds, like right now I'm working on a series that's, um, about ducks. So I've, I've, uh, I've gotten into ducks of late and there's, um, there's actually where I live about an hour and a half away from me is the Sullivan Heights bird park, which has one of the most amazing, uh, collections, not the right word, um, lack of term collection of birds uh, we'll go uh, yeah but like a lot of them are rescues and like a lot are like uh in like various programs um but they have some of the birds that like I've been just dreaming of seeing and I'm, I'm never going to see because like the, there's a bird called the Himalayan mono pheasant I'm not gonna be able to go to the wilds of Himalaya and and be able to find this bird most likely um and so like they have one, it's the most iridescent bird in the world. And it's just like, it's drool worthy. Again, we'll have to write it down so people can go look it up. But it's like, it's one that's like a gentle nemesis of mine where I'm like, I want to do this bird, but how do I pay it homage? I need to figure that out still. Like I, that kind of thing. Um, there's a, and like, so I have like a wood duck going on right now. Um, the Mandarin duck also. It's also my gentle nemesis. I've designed it four times and still never woven it. <laughs> I'm too scared of it. I'm like, I need to be, oh. it needs to be right. So I'm just like mm -hmm. continually working on it. <laughs> like, um, but yeah. And then I, I mean, eventually I, I do some sea creatures as well, but it's kind of like, I'm, I have a very long list of birds that still have my, my heart is like, these have to happen. <laughs> so. Do you have a certain amount of warps? Do you do a number of warps for each bird mm -hmm. or? kind of one for inspiring creature uh so it depends um I have so like for the wearable items um I have at this point I have like three main sizes so I'll tend to do one um colorway so like one bird I'll do it at least two if not all three sizes um because I'll dye up like a sample warp first and then I'll be like okay I need to tweak x colors or whatnot um and then I'll dye it for the other ones um, in various sizes. Or sometimes if I'm just like really gung-ho and I know that I'm probably gonna like it, if it's got blue and orange combo, which is what most kingfishers are, uh, it's just going straight to the, the warp for the loom because I, I don't need to, I know I'm gonna like it. Um, yeah, so it just depends. And then like for wall pieces, I do a lot of one-offs um, that are very custom dyed for it to look a certain way on the wall. Right. Well, this next slide is an overhead weaving mm -hmm. um, or displayed at overhead. Um, how did this project come about? So this is actually a hoopa for a wedding. Um, so I've done, I do these, I do around like one to three-ish a year. It just depends on, on when people contact me. Um, but yeah, so this one, the client wanted a circular design um and so you can see there's a seam because when you're looking for the bottom you can definitely see it but I did not have a loom that could go that wide at that time so I had to panel it um but 
yeah, so it's a hoopah, so it's hanging suspended over the couple um, out during their wedding ceremony to represent a house, um, and all the walls are open, um, so that shows that they're open to inviting everyone into their their house and their future life. Um, so it's really fun. I've done a couple of these. Um, I did. There's one up in um, a synagogue in New York City. That's their permanent one. Um, so it's it's a really really wonderful thing that I've had the opportunity to make for people's very happy occasions. And I really like when I know that my pieces are involved in such major life experiences, but also even just like knowing that people are enjoying them and using them and experiencing life within pieces or seeing them. That I think that's a really kind of like magical, wonderful component of things. But that's very special. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> a very special commission. Mm -hmm. uh, we talked a little bit about teaching. Um, now, do you have uh, different approaches when you teach like structure or how to weave versus how to use color? Uh, yeah. So it's, I mean, like I've taught uh, anything from like little, like little kids on like little table looms and whatnot to, uh, I teach at the conferences now as well. Um, and so it's a lot of fun. Um, I think it really depends on the class and the setting as to how I go about teaching it. Um, like I teach, I have a, a school that I teach high schoolers how to weave and that's always a really entertaining thing um, to do. And I'm like high schoolers and table looms. I'm like, okay, let's get into this. And I'm like, we'll get it. And it's like, and they do really fun things. Um, and then like the counter is like when I'm at a workshop and I'm like, okay, we have two days. We're going to cover X amount of information. I'm going to try to give you as much as I can um, just to be able like, cause like they'll be able to go home and be like, they can think about it. And I'm always available to anyone who I've taught to be like, Hey, like just shoot me an email, like, or we can always chat. Um, and so it's kind of just like, depends on, on where I'm teaching more so, um, as far as that goes. And then like, um, yeah, cause I'm teaching a, I haven't taught a workshop yet with actual looms. I taught dyeing workshops, um, but I'm teaching a weaving workshop, um, next year at MAFA. So that's really, I exciting. saw that at MAFA. It, it's, yeah. um, it was about shapes. Is that yes. right? What's the, what's the title of that class? I believe it's beyond the rectangle if I remember correctly I I'm looking a lot of classes like designing a lot of classes right now and so it's kind of like wait which one we're we talking about um but yeah it's, it's like my my master's thesis work was all non-rectangular uh weaving with edges and like raw yarn and such like that and so I, I really like playing with that and so yeah so it's like things like that where it's like how do we you know how do I give people enough information and tools so that they can be explore as much as possible like in the, when they're present with it and then also like I will hope to inspire them to keep playing with various things whether it's the technique we did or just the ideas that we've talked about in class yeah play 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 All, always <laughs> <laughs> so the next slide uh it's a scarf woven by Patty Lamb uh she's a very accomplished weaver now on her website, she gives you credit for being the person who dyed the yarn. So mm -hmm. how does it feel to see your yarn used by a well-known fiber artist? Uh, well, Patty and I are friends. Uh, she's a member of my guild and my standing joke with Patty, which I hope she sees this Hi, Patty, uh, <laughs> is that I always tell her that I wanna be her when I grow up. And she looks at me and she's like, you're already doing this. <laughs> and I'm always like, but I still wanna be you when I grow up, Patty. <laughs> like, um, it's, it's really, I really love the fact that like someone like Patty takes my warps that I've dyed and then like again puts their own spin on it and adds their own magic um I it's why I started dyeing warps to sell for weavers um because again not everybody wants to die um not everyone has a space to die or the equipment to do it and I totally get it I started on like a kitchen counter table thing and I'm like I, I, I never again <laughs> I, I like things very separate um and I also was tired of my, my socks being pink at the end of the day. Um, so, but like I, it's, it's such a wonderfully magical experience when people take one of the warps and weave it up and they like send when they send me pictures of it or they're like, Hey, I finally like used it or whatnot. Um, because all I want is to be able to help like people have more fun at their looms and like get to, as we said, play and experience new things. And like, I mean, it's really funny because um, at our guild's uh, annual sew and sale, Patty and I are generally next to each other. So it will always be funny. I'll be like, oh, that warp is the one that's in that scarf and things of that variety. So it's it's really quite an entertaining and fun. And, and I am honored that she has 
bought some for me and like uses them and everything. It's, it's, it's really quite an honor to see anyone use them in general. I'm like, oh my gosh, look, they're out in the world. That's cool. That's, I like that, uh, how you're next to each other. And as uh, uh, someone who would buy something, it's like, how great to see, you know, it in use already. Did anything surprise you about this scarf? Uh, uh, I, I, nothing, it's very her style. Um, so there's that, her addition of the stripe and the extra asymmetrical element, mm -hmm. top notch. Her design skills are phenomenal. Um, yeah, so it's like, just, it's so fascinating to see like how she presents it um, and like how she chose to, I mean, like the color combo is lovely. Um, and so it's just really fun to like see, like again, pulling the reds in there. And I'm like, oh, I wouldn't have actually mixed those per se, but like, I think they work great. That is interesting. Someone else's voice with your materials or your combos. Yeah. That's cool to see. Uh, now you, your first workshop was after you'd been weaving already for 15 years. Uh, that's so interesting. Now, what did you find to be the biggest surprise of taking part in a structured class? Uh, so it was interesting because, I mean, I came from the background of like learning in academics. So it was like, I've been weaving and taking classes in college and I've been weaving and taking classes as a grad student. Um, and so I was like, okay. And it was during, um, it was during COVID. Um, and so I was, my guild was putting on, it was when Zoom workshops were starting to happen. Um, and so Denise Cavant's workshop was coming up with Echo Weave. And I was like, let's talk about like color and like, you know, fun pattern combos and like learning new things. And of course I fell in love the most with the double weave version of this. And I was like, oh good God, how many, I was like so many ends. Um, I'm like, that's just not super conducive to production. And I, I'm like micro, I'm a mini production weaver is how I, I refer to it. Um, but like, so like I like wrote her and I was like, hey, so I dye yarn, can I dye two warps and then like throw these on to the, like in the patterns instead of just using like solids. And she was totally down with it. Um, and so it was really interesting. I think a lot of fun for me to like take a workshop for the first time because I've taken workshops not in weaving and like paper making and book binding and like all these other things at like the big craft schools at like Penland and Aramont and whatnot. But I'd never taken a weaving workshop. Um, and so it was, I thought it was a lot of fun. Uh, she's a, Denise is a fantastic teacher. Um, I am now friends with her and like we chat and like we meet up at the conferences and everything. And so like, that's a lot of fun to like, you know, get to meet people and be like, I took your class. Oh my gosh. And now I'm like doing, we're like both doing things. Um, so it was really quite fun. I love parallel threading. I think it's a magical process and the amount of color you can change within a single threading by just changing treadling and color patterns and oh my god it's so good <laughs> so it's and like iridescence so like that component and like how to push that with the idea of like the iridescence in nature and like feathers like like hummingbirds when they turn their heads all of a sudden they have different colors it's just like oh! so it's like the the ideas of like how to use this um, in relation to that is there's a lot and I, I just need, um, I need more time. <laughs> that's why you're getting back to the loom and you can't, uh, that's why the boss is sending you back to the loom. Exactly. That's why I said sometimes gently mean boss, not really mean, just gently mean. <laughs> I understand. <laughs> uh, so what's next for you? Ooh, that's a great question. Um, again, I'm designing some more classes because I'd like to continue to like teach at conferences and teach with guilds. Um, I think that's a lot of fun. I like adding to the weaving community and like kind of just continue to like bring more people in and like inspire them in various ways if I can. Um, probably work and I'm, wor I'm working on some kits for some people, for things. Um, and then getting a little bit plans for next year for some uh, more art pieces and kind of pushing that idea and a little bit, a little bit of garments, still pretending I know how to sew, I don't. but I'm working on it. <laughs> That's important. <laughs> yeah. So it's like that kind of stuff where it's kind of just like, okay, like, you know, I've woven sh scarves and shawls for a long, long time for me at this point. And I'm kind of like, okay, how do I continue to branch out, but also like still retain this component of it, but like push, push in different ways, um, kind of go a little bit back to the roots um, as far as like the fine art component of weaving and like, how do I do that? Like, 
where do I explore? How do I design more patterns and things like that? So it's like, that's kind of, I think the general gist of it. And then I'm excited for, um, once my show season for winter, fall, winter is done where I get to go hang out with my horse. <laughs> uh, a nice balance. <laughs> yes. I go from the studio, which is clean to the outside world. This is just like, definitely not. <laughs> well, let's get to some questions uh, from our Q and A. Let's see. Um, I'll go back. Uh, Meg Wilson is asking, um, Sydney, do you ever weave with your beautifully colored hair? Uh, I haven't woven with human hair. I have woven with horse hair and dog hair before. Um, I grew up having a Samoyed, which they're a hyperallergenic and we saved all her hair. And it was before I was a weaver. We got it all carded and I wove three blankets from one for my parents, one for me, one for my sister. So we all have merino wool and dog hair blankets. <laughs> Wow. Oh, they must be super warm. They are. They're very nice. <laughs> uh, Sharon Smith asked if there's a fiber you prefer. You said tensil. Yeah. Um, Joey Barnes said, I just ordered three warps. I really love your color sense and can't wait to get these on my loom. Thanks. Uh, Carrie Gordon's uh, saying, Sydney, what is the commercial dye that you use on the tensil? Uh, so I use uh, MX reactive dyes. Um, I live in North Carolina, so I order mostly from Pro Chemical because they are on the East Coast. And then also I get a couple from Dharma, which is West Coast. And that's really just because of shipping. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I use those dyes and then soda ash, which I actually just buy from the grocery store because it's washing soda. It's the same thing. Mm. Um, yeah, so that's what I use. I think it's, I, it's lovely. Um, I have no complaints and it's not all non-toxic, which again, ties into my whole, um, sustainability is a big component of my studio. I'm, I'm almost plastic free minus packaging of like dyes. Those are common plastic containers. Um, and anything I like material wise that comes with that. Um, but otherwise I make very little to no waste. Um, I compost my tiny scraps at home. Ah, <laughs> uh, that's find a way to use them. <laughs> yeah, I just have a bucket that says yarn schniblets and eventually they'll have a job. <laughs> Mary Warren is asking, do you exhaust dyeing so you use all the dye up? Thank you. Um, so if I was dyeing wools, I would exhaust dye. Um, but with cellulose fibers, you don't exhaust the dye, um, or at least not in the same way I'm thinking about it as exhaust as, as far as exhausting like the water runs clear um so like when you're doing these I they're hand painted um and if I'm dying skeins they're in a bucket and the water will still look like it has dye in it but it's it's exhausted in the standpoint of like the no more chemical reaction will happen um and so from that standpoint yes and no <laughs> And Joyce Rogers is asking, coming from a fine arts background, did you have a surprising learning curve blending cover colors and weaving? Because she said she did. Um, I don't think so. Um, yeah, I don't think so. I think because it's like, I, I mean, I came like, I, when I say my fine art background, it's like, I, <laughs> again, <clears throat> I've never taken a drawing class either. Um, so that thing, drawing gives me anxiety. I took painting, um, but like I went to a liberal arts college. So I don't have like a traditional like that, like bachelor's in fine art. Um, I do have a master's in fine art, but it was already graduate level. So I was in the textiles department. Um, so it's like, I very much was like into fiber already. Um, and I think I just looked at a lot of, a lot of books. I just looked at a lot of books um, and like a lot of nature books. And so that, again, there's a lot of color in all of those. And, and so I think for that, for me, I didn't find that was a hard thing to like bridge personally. Mm -hmm. um, Anne-Marie Mullen um, has a lot of great comments, uh, but she's saying, um, I'm gonna do pick one question from this. How do you take care of your body so you can keep on weaving? Oh, that is a fantastic question. It sure um, is. That's hard. Um, so I've come up with a couple of different things and I actually work with a physical therapist um, because I personally actually have a spinal injury. Um, and so I, AVL Loom, she watched videos of me and she was like, oh, <laughs> 
Um, so like I actually currently weave with an ankle weight on one leg versus the other. Um, just because with ABL is only one foot pushes the pedal that carries the weight. So to counterbalance the effect on the body, I wear a counterbalance weight on the other leg. Um, I would have never thought of that. Um, but like one of the big things I do is, um, I wear compression gloves on my hands. Um, I think that's super helpful. Um, if you do standing work, so like my dye tables, I have a giant, uh, like, con like professional grade anti-fatigue, anti-skid mats. Cause it's gets wet and everything. Um, I think just listening to your body is key and like getting up and moving and getting a couple of like key stretches. Um, as far as like when you're working, so like you don't do too much to it. I always get around a move. I specifically stopped winding all my perns at once so that I have to get up when I finish a pern um, and, and wind it, which it balances my frustration <laughs> levels of being like, I want to be efficient, but I'm like, no, I need to move. Um, so I think for that, can, that's it's a hard thing. Uh, weaving is not super ergonomically great for our bodies. <laughs> um, but I think just like taking things like, work for you and like asking people around you, like, what are you doing for this? If something's causing you a problem? Um, I think it's definitely something that we could like use outside help on as far as like a genre, like getting some physical therapists or like that kind of thing to be like, Hey, like, how do we work on these things? Like stretches and like, how do you work with, like your hands or your shoulder? I know people have a lot on the shoulders. I don't use my, um, overhead fly shuttle system very often, unless I'm weaving over 36 inches. I can reach that far, but if I can't, then I'll eat. Otherwise I just throw it by hand because it's less, less destructive to my shoulders. <laughs> For <laughs> those millions of actions. Yeah. I mean, like I, again, because I'm a, like, I, I call myself a mini production weaver. Um, I'm weaving generally at a like more yardage, um, than the average weaver. I, I, I think, I don't know. Um, but I don't think, yeah. So it's like, that is also something to take into consideration. It's like, I'm dying thousands and thousands of pounds, thousands of yards of yarn. Um, I mean, I, I put on 15 to 30 yard warps at a time and, and then like that whole thing. So it's like, take it with a grain of salt as far as like the, like various components. I mean, like I probably average like, I don't know, on a non-weaving day where it's a more admin or die work, like two hours of weaving to some days it's like, six to eight hours of weaving a day it just depends on what's going on um yeah so but yeah listen to your body that's great wisdom um uh let's see i will ask another question um she's asked Anne marie mullen is asking how many shafts do you prefer um i'm a shaft junkie um so I have, I work mostly on 16 or 24, um, all the, there's two of my AVLs behind me. Um, these two are 16 and 16 shaft, both 60 inches wide. Um, and then I have a 24 shaft one as well. So, um, I, I have a complex pattern problem. Uh, <laughs> I like to make things you use the word prop. I mean, reference maybe, <laughs> I mean, I don't think it's like a bad problem. It's just a thing. Yeah. Um, so it's, yeah. So it's like, if I can make it more complex and gently harder by accident for myself, I'm going to do it. Um, but I do a lot of, I do a lot of tying on. So I take, take the same threading, but with it, because I'm designing with the computers, I can change so many things so that I can keep the same threading for a long time and get lots of different patterns at it. And I recently just started playing with block design, which is, um, kind of endless right now and I'm just like oh this is dangerous <laughs> so I'm like how many I think I'm on like the sixth warp on one of these things and I'm like let's change it completely and and it looks completely different um so I'm I'm, I'm having a blast with that one right now but yeah I, I I'm all the shafts I can I do have an eight an eight an eight shaft one and I do love it and I like teaching on eight or four um because I know that not everyone has the high level high end shafts but do you think there's also a gap in like the people who do work with the higher end shafts as far as like pattern sharing and like that kind of stuff mm -hmm. i think it's something mm -hmm. that we can share more of yeah uh well meg wilson is asking how much color or how much do you have to weave to get a good feel for all the color and pattern interactions 
Oh, uh, um, so it depends on how it's dyed. So it's like, if I'm doing like a long gradient, it might be an entire 70 inches before I've hit the full range of all the colors. Um, some of them, I can be all of like all the same, all the colors will show up in the first 20 inches. Um, it just depends for me on like which style warp because I paint them in different ways. So it's like that type. That's how you can see a chain. Um, and that, that one has a, like a longer gradient. And I think that gradient is like is equal to like one and a half, like one gradient per scarf. And I had like I designed a scarf series that the gradient was one scarf long. So the one side of the scarf is gray and it transitions throughout the length to be blue. So that way when you wear it, you can wear it so they have one side is gray and one side is blue and you can choose which you want to eccentric, like accent your outfit with. Um, so it's, I think it just depends. But sometimes I will, I will just, I like lay the weft yarn across various parts and because ABLs are so deep, I can generally see most of it or I'll just lay it next to the warp itself and try to like generally play with that color. Uh, Cindy Solomon's asking um, what your dye notes look like. Do you replicate painted warps over a period of time or do you paint a bunch and then you're done forever? Did you uh, did you touch on that earlier? Just that I probably touched on it, but not in the same way as the question. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, I have formulas that I follow that, I, that I've made up, um, and so like each one has like the actual like how much dye is used, what colors are used, how I lay the warp out, and then I have a uh, like watercolor sketch of like mm -hmm. how I've painted it actually onto the, a warp, um, and so. I, there's two different categories. I have warps that I dye that have been designed specifically for um, selling to other weavers. And then I have warps I'm using for just myself slash for like my like wearable products. Um, so I can repeat both, but like the ones that are for um, selling specifically, uh, like those I dye a couple at a time. Um, I run my my warps as diet to order so I'm not holding a bunch of backstock inventory on them. Um, and so like my, I have like lead times and everything like that. Then that way, you know, I can dye them up for people and they're nice and fresh and fun. Not that the colors go bad because they're, they're color past, but <laughs> I just like being like, cool, I'll dye it for you. No problem. Like, Well, it's Danielle Brodier. I think that's how you say it. Um, She's asking, do you dye your warp by dipping in the color tub or do you paint on your skein? Uh, on your website, you had a picture of you very playfully uh, mm -hmm. painting, which looks great. But uh, so how would you answer that question? Um, I, I don't really dip them in anything. Um, for the painted warps, I generally have a bunch of squirt bottles at this point and I just like squirt bottle them on and then just push it in. Um, that is one of the classes I teach. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it's a lot of fun. Um, but yeah, I do that. I, and like, if I'm doing, um, like to get warp pooling specifically, um, then I'll sometimes use like a foam brush. Um, I don't tend to think of my dye. Um, cause I, I like the bleed and how that looks. Um, but yeah, so, so like mostly I use squirt bottles and then if I'm not using a squirt bottle, I'll use a foam brush. Um, but like my skeins, they go in a bucket. So they would get like dipped um, or painted. It just depends on what I'm doing with it. Uh, Sue Garber is asking, what fiber is the warp in the Patty Lamb scarf? That is Tencel. Um, I, it's, I believe that one is 8-2 Tencel, if I remember correctly. Sometimes, sometimes I dye them in 10-2 for Patty because she likes thin yarn. Um, which I do have tend to as well. So like I do custom warps for people as well. Um, Cause that way I can have like thinner yarn or like different ends, like different ends per inch total. Um, so yeah. So that addresses Suzari's uh, question. Uh, what weight tensile do you use for your beautiful wearable items? Is that? Uh, eight to 10 to five to yes. <laughs> I'll, I, I blend some of them. I like the mill that I get it from, uh, the eight, two and the 10, two are very close. Um, mm -hmm. so I've historically, I blend those in the warp and then the weft, it just depends on how I want it to, to fall. Um, but I mostly work in eight, two. I like the weight. It drapes really nicely. Like this, this is actually, um, eight, two tensile and tensile cotton alternating in the warp and then just a tensile weft. 
Um, but like the drape is so good on that stuff. And so it lends itself so well to, to scarves and like how they work and people. And I just, it's just so, it's so fun to work with. <laughs> just, yeah. I really like it. It's, that's, it makes me want to put some tinsel on <laughs> right now. Uh, Ellen Turner, it's more of a comment. Uh, what's that again? I said, I recommend it. <laughs> what's that, Sydney? Getting tinsel on your All head. right, all right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Ellen Turner, uh, it's more of a comment. We can't wait to see you at the Florida Tropical, uh, Tropical Weavers Guild Conference in o Orlando in April. Yes, cool. I'm excited to come down there. Cool. Um, now this is a dye question. I, I'm not a dyer, so I don't know. It's, it kind of doesn't make sense to me. Do you dye solids to go with warps? Yes, was the answer. Um, so okay. I'll dye solid skeins. Um, I call them oh. semi-solid because I'm not like super into making them like perfectly the same. Um, they're hand dyed. That's kind of the nature of it. I kind of lean into that. They're not like blotchy, but they're not necessarily always like this is the same level as commercial dyed. Like it's it's hand dyed. Um, there might be some flex left over just because I let the dye kind of do its thing. But yeah, I do so I do solids for that. Uh, Sharon Smith earlier asked, is there one basic color you're drawn to? Blues, she's asking. One basic color? Yeah. Uh, blue. Uh, blue everything. I'll, always blue. Oh, uh, yeah. I think, yeah, you might. Yep, Actually, yep, I, yep. I thought you'd like my mug. I do like your mug. It, we have the same drippy effect mugs. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, blue. Um, if I can combine, if I could weave in only uh, one to two colors, it would be blue and orange. And Dor Dornan Trainer uh, is asking, are you showing slash selling at the Richmond, Virginia Craft and Design Show? Uh, still to be determined on that one. I'm currently on the wait list for that show. Um, but if you're in the Richmond area and if you aren't doing anything, not this weekend, but next weekend, I will be showing at the Smithsonian in two weeks. So you can come to DC and see me. That's wonderful, Sydney. Very excited about that. <laughs> Um, well, I, it's been a pleasure talking with you and seeing your work. Yes. Thank you yeah. so much. Thank you so much, Sydney. <laughs> so you can learn more about Sydney and her work at sydneysogel.com. Um, let's see. So, uh, thank you to the Carolina Fiber Fest for sponsoring this episode of Textiles and Tea. Uh, it, the Fiber Fest is March 14th and 15th, 2025, Raleigh, North Carolina. If you or your guild would like to sponsor an episode of Textiles and Tea, you can learn more at weavespindye.org. Uh, spinning and Weaving Week. Uh, registration is open for HGA's virtual event, Spinning and Weaving Week Celebration. For $30, that is such a good deal. For $30, HGA members will receive access to studio tours, thread talks, panel discussions, and so much more. And the best part is that it's recorded and you'll get to enjoy it off from your home at your convenience. It's less than a month away, so save the date, October 7th through the 13th, 2024. Visit the HGA website to view any updates to the schedule. If you are a vendor or teacher, please reach out to HGA and learn about all the opportunities that are available. Textiles and Tea is supported by your generous donations. If you would like to see more programming like this, please support HGA by becoming a member or donating or both. You can join and or donate on the HGA website, weavespindye.org. If you missed part of this episode and would like to watch it again or share it with a friend, Textiles and Tea is recorded and can be viewed on HGA's Facebook page. Or you can subscribe to the HGA YouTube channel where you can view the entire series and more. So please join me next week when I'm back as guest host and sharing tea with Andrea Alexander. Thank you and happy tea.